Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our Lunch and Learn series. I am Carla Williams Scott, Director of the City of Columbus Department of Neighborhoods, and it's my pleasure to have you join us for today's virtual Lunch and Learn series. Our series today um, for this year is focused around the, a woman's journey in Columbus. Um, each session that we are doing will explore uh, barriers facing women in our community and how each of us can contribute um, to reducing gender discrimination. So we've got a great conversation for you today, a great group of panelists. Uh, we've focused on this series as a woman's journey as a way to, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. I would like to thank our co-conveners for this series, uh, which is the Columbus Women's Commission and the Women's Fund of Central Ohio. I would also like to thank our community relations commissioners that have been a part of this process that have helped to plan today's session. Uh, Commissioner Allison Poye, who is on our Lunch and Learn, um, that leads the Lunch and Learn series, and Commissioner Linda Caney, who will serve as our moderator for today. From the perspective of the Department of Neighborhoods, uh, we believe that it is, we want to share in the mayor's equal opportunity city um, and his equity agenda for all. And so that makes this Lunch and Learn series even more special. Um, for the work that we are currently doing as a city. Um, I also want to thank all of our pan panel members for joining us to share insights on this topic. Um, and today's health disparities is a very timely conversation. Um, as we all know that uh, people of color are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And then we also know that just recently this week, our county commissioners declared racism as um, a, a health priority. And so um, I think this discussion is very timely. And so it is now my pleasure to welcome Sarah Parisier, who will welcome, who will provide welcoming remarks on behalf of the Women's Front Fund of Central Ohio. So Sarah, take it away. Thank you so much, Director William Scott. The Women's Fund has been so proud to partner with the Community Relations Commission um, over these past few months and throughout the course of 2020 to really shine a spotlight on these issues that are most critical to women in our community. Um, and the Women's Fund of Central Ohio is an organization fiercely committed to igniting social change for gender equality. And we do that through conversation, connecting people and organizations, influencing opportunities for economic empowerment and leadership for women and girls. And it's through the pillows of our work, grant making, advocacy, research, partnerships and community education that we're able to inform and affect policy, disrupt social norms and build capacity in our community to truly create change that's critically needed for women and girls to thrive. And we are, we, as I said, we're honored to partner with the Community Relations Commission and the Columbus Women's Commission to really um, focus on these issues. And it matters so much today um, even more than when we had these conversations uh, nearly a year ago in terms of this lineup to really focus on health inequities. Um, we know that, that, has been, that there have been gender and racial health inequities due to historic and structural policies as well as gender norms, and that COVID-19 has only exacerbated and amplified these. And so we are hopeful that today's conversation will be part of so much work that is truly led by the leaders on this call and in this conversation um, to think critically about what we can do as individuals, as organizations, to shape the community and the policy to support all women and girls to be able to thrive um, in Columbus. So uh, proud to introduce one of our, our partners in this work and in so much more with the Columbus Women's Commission. Kate McGarvey is a commissioner for the Columbus Women's Commission and also chair of the Health Committee. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I appreciate the introduction and I wanna thank the Community Relations Commission for hosting this important conversation um, as well as others and for focusing on gender uh, for this year's series of Lunch and Learns. I'd also like to thank and recognize Iris Harvey, a fellow commissioner who is also on today's panel. Uh, we're just thrilled to be able to partner in this work, um, in these events, but also with the city and others generally, um, and to take the time to, to really speak with and uh, hear from the residents. 
As Sarah said, my name is Kate McGarvey, I'm the Executive Director of Ohio State Legal Services. It includes the Legal Aid Society of Columbus. And our mission is to provide civil legal aid and advocacy to combat unfairness and injustice and to help people rise out of poverty. Um, the vast majority of our clients are women, and a disproportionate um, number of our clients are um, individuals of color. So this work is, is very important to, to my job as well. A, a little bit about the work of the commission. The Columbus Women's Commission was first announced at the mayor's inaugural address in 2017, and it was created from the leadership and passion of the mayor and of Lady, uh, First Lady Shannon Ginther. Uh, it was a result of knowing that there are gender and racial inequities um, in our community and trying to work to address those. Today, we have 24 appointed commissioners um, who guide and steer our work. Our mission is to achieve economic security for all women in Columbus, and we do this by raising awareness and by driving policy change. We have four focuses, health, workforce development, housing, and pay equity. Today's conversation is more timely and important than ever. We're seeing the impact of COVID-19 on women uh, locally and throughout the, nature, the nation, as well as racial and gender disparities um, with that impact. Women in Columbus represent 52% of all COVID-19 positive cases, um, and domestic violence and human trafficking is also on the rise as a result of the pandemic. We know that Black women are among the most at risk for experiencing health inequities, including high infant mortality and high rates of teen teenage pregnancy. Even without COVID-19, we know that accessibility, affordability, and equity in healthcare impacts a woman's economic security for a lifetime. The Columbus Women's Commission's work in the area of health is focused on increasing access to comprehensive, medically accurate health education for Columbus teens. Working with the City of Columbus, Celebrate One Initiative, and Education Partners, the Commission is influencing local policy to bring comprehensive, medically accurate teen health education to Columbus City Schools in the 2019-2020 school year and beyond. We're also continuing to explore human trafficking and where the Commission can play a role in that work. As we continue to move the needle and focus on policy change, it's important to address health equity and understand its needs in our community. To that end, I wanna thank the mayor and Dr. Roberts for taking the bold step to open a new Center for Public Health Innovation to address racism as a public health issue. So thank you again uh, for holding these important conversations and for focusing on gender in this year's series. Um, thank you as well to the Women's Fund uh, for all of the work that you do. With that, I wanna introduce uh, Linda Candy, who will be moderating today's panel. Linda is a commissioner on the Community Relations Commission who is committed to advocacy for black women and girls. She has dedicated her adult life to the adv advancement and empowerment of women and girls. From her 32 year career at two YWCA's to becoming the chartering president of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Central Ohio chapter, as well as many other achievements. Linda is dedicated to the elimination of racism and the empowerment of women. We thank Linda for serving as the moderator for today's important conversation. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, Kate. Um, it's nice to meet you on screen. Uh, good, evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, important topic of achieving health equity. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I am the president of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Inc. Central Ohio chapter and proud uh, commission member of the Community Relations Commission. So I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of this discussion and to be um, facilitating conversation with these um, very experienced and accomplished uh, panelists that we have assembled today. Um, the Coalition of 100 Black Women advocates for Black women and girls to address disparities in the areas of health, education, and economic empowerment. So I'm particularly interested in this topic today um, and also as a commission member. Um, so as you as you probably aware and, and you've heard stated earlier, uh, local officials have declared racism a uh, public health crisis. Uh, and this has been highlighted by the fact that black and brown people are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And so while this made headlines in the media, this was not breaking news by, by any means. Um, but we would need another lunch and learn to delve into the reasons and the causes and the impacts of, of that. So for today's discussion, we'll, we'll focus on achieving health equity 
in America's opportunity city. Uh, so what does it mean to be an opportunity city? According to Mayor Ginther, Columbus is America's opportunity center because we embrace diversity and celebrate the various benefits and cultures of our residents and visitors. This designation as an opportunity city reflects the ranking of Columbus as being a low cost for home ownership. Uh, we have major universities, we have thriving arts and cultural scene, top tier hospitals, low unemployment. That was before COVID-19, however. We have the best zoo, the best science center, and the only National Veterans Memorial and Museum in America. Columbus has been named best American city to work in the field of tech, top rising city for startups, small, a smart city of the year, best city for new college grads, best city to be young, broke, and single. That is, leaves me out particularly in the young and single category. Uh, most spectacular pride celebration, uh, one of the top three cities for Black-owned small businesses, again, pre-COVID-19. Uh, best city for single women, most underrated city for gay travelers, the second safest city for young families, top 10 cities for largest producers of craft beer, the best Italian restaurant in the Midwest, and the only city in the history of the world to save their sports team from moving. So we have a lot of accomplishments and a lot of firsts. So while we're very proud of Columbus as an opportunity city, where do we or where would we rank as one of the healthiest cities in America? According to the World Health Organization, a healthy city is one that is continually creating and improving physical and social environments and expanding community resources, which enable people to mutually support each other in performing all the functions of life and developing to their maximum potential. So a healthy city aims to create a health uh, and supportive environment to achieve a good quality of life, to provide basic sanitation and hygiene needs, and to supply access to quality, affordable health care. So what and how are we doing to achieve health equity and to become a healthy city as we are an opportunity city? So we have assembled a panel of community experts to answer this question and to provide some insight into achieving health equity. So we're joined today by Julia Applegate, Applegate. Uh, Julia, wave your hand. Julia is the director of Equitas Health Institute. So thank you, Julia, for being with us today. We also have Iris Harvey, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio and commissioner for the Columbus Women's Commission. So thank you for being with us, Iris. Uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Mashika Roberts, Health Commissioner with the Columbus Public Health. I know that you all have had the pleasure of seeing Dr. Roberts on TV a lot lately. She's been uh, a reassuring and calming voice for providing information for all of us during this COVID-19. So we thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for making time to be with us um, this afternoon. And we are also joined by um, former Senator Charlita Tavares, currently CEO of the Columbus Neighborhood Health Center, Primary One Health, um, and a charter member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. So I wanted to put that in there as well. So thank you all to our panelists for being with us this afternoon. So to get us started with this conversation, um, what does it look like from your perspective to be a healthy city? What are what would you say are some of the characteristics of being a health determined uh, as a healthy city? And maybe Dr. Roberts, you might want to start with that with that one.
if you are muted, okay. there you go. There go. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you um, for that. And sure, you know, I think to be a healthy city, it's a city like the mayor says, an opportunity city where everyone in our community has the opportunity to thrive. And thrive means everything from living a healthy lifestyle to living to your full potential, which means we have a life expectancy that is shared among everyone. And we don't have one um, part of our community that has a much longer life expectancy than others. We don't have certain zip codes where people are more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes or obesity than other zip codes. We have areas of our community where everyone has access to recreational activities, healthy living with access to safe foods and exercise, um, as well as everyone has access to not only healthcare, but quality healthcare. So to me, a healthy city is a city where everyone has the opportunity to thrive to their full potential. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, I still wanna call you Senator Devarez, so I'm gonna do that today. Um, so would you like to uh, add anything to that? I thank you very much, um, Linda. And, and I think Dr. Roberts really shared uh, most of what I would have said with respect to how we become, stay an opportunity city and a healthy, equitable city. Uh, the only thing that I would share is that our health outcomes would be equitable amongst racial and ethnic populations within our community. Um, to, to know that between two and seven times the rate um, that African American and, and women of color, men and children of color, anywhere from two times to seven times the rate of our Caucasian uh, women, men and children in the disease areas, this is what we have to strive for, to have equitable health outcomes for individuals in order to be that healthy, uh, equitable, and opportunity city and to maintain that, uh, to ensure that those health outcomes are the same. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Julia, do you, want to add, do you have anything you wanna add? Sure, yeah, I've just built on, on both of what was just said. Um, I think for me, one of the things that comes to my mind is an environment, a city, a home where people are able to be true to themselves. And in the field that I work in, that's around sexual orientation and gender identity. And there are um, very large health disparities that are affect um, the population I work with that I think need to be addressed as well. And when we create environments where people can be true to themselves um, and we embrace all people and their differences, then I think that, that the environment is more conducive to healthy um, to health and to opportunity. Wonderful, okay, thank you. Uh, Iris, you want, anything you wanna add? You're on mute, you're mute. Iris? There we go. Actually, I'm not on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, great. So I would agree with um, my fellow uh, panelists. I think the other thing that we might add to this is that, um, a city can't stand by itself. It has, it lives within a broader environment. And we know that Ohio actually ranks fairly low in terms of healthcare value. And so I think, you know, when we think about the um, investment that we make in healthcare as a state, as a city, and as individuals, uh, we want the equity to be one with the return on investment is proven in terms of health outcomes. And so that's one of the things that I think we work on in Ohio to make sure that uh, people are getting health, not only getting the health care, but that the health care is actually translating to improved outcomes, that they're becoming healthier, that they're living healthier lives, and that they're becoming more prosperous. And, and that to me is, is the equity that we're trying to build uh, in our city. Great, thank you, thank you. So we use the term health equity. Why is that important? Uh, why is that an important topic for us to be discussing today? And I think I'll start with Julia, if you'd like to um, address that. Why, why is the topic of health equity important? Yeah, I think um, 
you know, many people are caught in a misunderstanding or a false equivalency between equality and equity and helping folks understand that those aren't exactly the same concepts. Um, so equity, we have to have an understanding that equity means we divide up our resources according to need. And um, there are some, there are structures in place that um, result in differing levels of need. So I think that, you know, addressing racism, sexism, homophobia, those things, we can't do that fully until we understand that in order to address the inequities that are a result of these um, systematic isms, we have to divide up what is available to us a little bit differently. We need to, you know, direct the resources where the resources are needed. And um, for me, that's part of what I love about public health is that, that you know, you see public health in action where the need is greatest. And um, without understanding the role that equity plays in health and health outcomes, and we, we can't do that. So I think we have to help our residents understand that it may be a little bit of reframing for folks to wrap their heads around the concept of equity but our outcomes will actually improve if we do that. Great, thank you. Anyone like to um, add to Julia's comments? Um, Linda, Charlita? Yeah, Charlita? Linda, I would like to, to add to that and I appreciate uh, Julia's uh, concept of equity and what is equal. Uh, because again, it is reframing uh, in many cases, um, the funding as well as policies. Uh, because if a policy disproportionately or negatively impacts one group within our community, then it means uh, we've got to address it in some way. Sometimes it's a, a change in policy so that we don't negatively impact or produce an outcome that's negative for one group within our community than another group. Uh, and that's why concepts around um, impact statements uh, are very important when you're looking at developing policy for a broad swath of our community or for the city of Columbus, the county of Franklin, the state of Ohio, or the nation as a whole. Uh, you've got to look at who's bearing the burden of disease and illness at greater levels. So then you see where you need to put your resources, where you need to change policies in order to address those inequities. I'd like to add to that. Uh -huh. I, I think that one of the exciting things, <clears throat> excuse me, about this panel and the work that we do on the commission is that equity really is also about who's at the table and who's not at the table. Because, <clears throat> sorry, got a little frog here. If the right people aren't at the table, if the people who are being marginalized, if it's the people who uh, don't have the equal opportunity, then you can't have equity. You, equity. you can determine policies that you think will meet their needs. You can invest in policies and practices. But if they're not at the table informing what do I need? What do I want? How will you change my life? Then you're really not dealing uh, with an equitable situation. I think another element when I think about equity also is that a lot of times we are looking to public policy to bring equity into our society. And I would like to, especially when it comes to health care, I'd like to suggest that we need health equity to be centered in both the policies and the practices of the public sector and the private sector. So we can't let one part of our society do all the work because we know it can't, it's part of the system, and we can't let the other part uh, not be held accountable. So, you know, one of the things I'd like to suggest is that uh, as we look to an opportunity city and we look to women and their health equity, we should start asking at every meeting, at every opportunity, at every investment, where is health equity centered in this practice? Where is it centered in this policy? How will, if we're talking about women, how will women benefit from this, especially those that have been marginalized, not just because of race, but also because of income and gender identity. So that to me is an important part of equity. To follow up on that, so what would that, what would a response be to that, to the question of 
um, how does health equity show up and what does it look like in terms of a public and private partnership? Sure. How would we know if when that's when that's happening? And maybe you know you have an answer and maybe you don't, but well, I think it, it can be a public-private partnership and it should be, but at the same time, I think each sector needs to take the responsibility for pushing equity in its own system. Coming together is important, but um, also having a, a system internally that says this is what's important to us, this is what's important to our community. So for instance, if we look at public policy and we look at uh, you know, low-income women, we have a public policy, let's call it Medicaid, you know, a safety net uh, way of getting health care. That's there, but it doesn't cover uh, it covers the needs of some people, uh, but it doesn't cover the needs of others. And when we look about disparities, we know that at least 30% of women who are on Medicaid, for instance, also say that they have poor health. But we also see that in the private sector, the private sector is focusing on, so let me go back. When the public sector, we look at the big investment that we make in safety net, and we can say that health outcomes are not improving the way we want. We've had conversations about infant mortality and maternal mortality and things of that nature. So we're not seeing the outcomes as much as we want. But um, in the private sector, in trying to build in health and at least, you know, almost 40% of women get their health insurance through a private company, a private employer. And so we need to also say, how are you developing those policies? Are you moving more of the responsibility for paying for your health care onto the woman in terms of deductibles, in terms of the annual, you know, the annual fees that are charged? And can people afford that? And has the we know that the price of insurance has increased so substantially that it's almost like a silent killer to many, to many people. Women are being um, uh, I think uh, shut out of good health care, and there are a lot of factors you have to think about. They're usually in lower wage jobs. Um, more than likely, about half of women get their health insurance through a spouse, so they're dependent on the spouse continuation of his his job or, or her job, however the case may be. And so I think unless we are saying to the private sector, you need to look at health equity through a lens of financial equity, financial uh, feasibility, and not just um, m minimizing your costs. Then it, it, you're leaving again all of the responsibility to the public sector to try and make up for that gap. So I think you have to have both tracks. And, and therefore, it should be a partnership, but we should not leave each individual uh, sector unresponsible for developing things that really work within its system as well. Okay, thank you, thank you. Any other thoughts on that? I, I think, this is Charlita again, I, I guess I would um, echo what Iris just shared. Uh, we can't leave one sector out or the other. But I think one of the ways that the public sector can hold the private sector accountable is through the resources that the public sector gives to the private sector. Yeah. Um, that in order to make sure that they are doing what is right, fair, and equitable for women and girls throughout this country, or and, and specifically for the city of Columbus, um, then we have to look at where they're receiving resources or uh, tax breaks or whatever to say, in order to get these benefits from these public coffers that belong to all the taxpayers, you are going to have to abide by X, Y, and Z. As an opportunity uh, city, we wanna make sure that uh, you are treating your employees equitably, that you are providing the healthcare policy plan, because remember, the the employer decides which insurance plan right. they are going to offer to their employees. And the employer makes the decision whether or not they're going to have comprehensive family planning in that insurance policy. 
um, the employer decides whether domestic partners are going to be included in that insurance plan. So City of Columbus, County of Franklin, State of Ohio, we can say if we are going to treat all of our employees equitably, right. if we are going to make sure that women and girls have what they need in order to live healthy, productive lives, then we need to make sure that these things are addressed. And that's why I'm very excited that uh, we have a legislator, a female a woman a legislator in um, Franklin County who has reintroduced a bill that I introduced when I was in the Senate uh, her bill is House Bill 620. It's Representative Erica Crawley out of Franklin County. It's health and equity in all policies. That gets back to the impact statement that I talked about earlier. Every piece of legislation that's going to go through the General Assembly when this bill is passed will be looked at through a health lens. It will look at, is this going to have a disparate impact on women? Is it going to have a disparate impact on people of color? And then legislators will have to make the decision themselves when they hear from the public, when they hear from the impact statement that some parts of our community are going to be negatively impacted, then they will make the decision, I'm gonna do it anyway, or no, let's make some changes in the policy so we do not have these disparate impacts amongst uh, our residents of the state of Ohio. So that's one way we can get at it because it's not just looking at health. Remember, the clinical health that we provide to people is only about 20% of the health outcome. 80% is on behavior and the social determinants of health, be it the built environment, passive and active recreational activities, the environmental uh, toxins in the air, employment or lack thereof, um, education, uh, housing, all of those things that are impacting the 80% of what is that health outcome. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any of you want, else want to add anything at this point? So you talked a lot about uh, outcomes and, and impact. So what do you see as the, as, as the difference in having access to health care and then achieving health equity? Uh, I know you've talked about this, you know, this partnership and looking at, at, uh, at impact, but are there other um, distinguishing uh, points about the difference between having access to health care and actually achieving the equity that we've been talking about. And I was uh, glad that Julia brought up the difference between um, equality and equity, um, because I think sometimes we use those two uh, to mean the same thing and they're very, very different. So what's the difference in having access to healthcare and actually achieving um, the healthy outcomes that we're looking for that we would expect from a healthy community? So I'll chime in here if it's okay. Um, you know, I think giving everyone an insurance card and saying you have access to healthcare and you can go anywhere and get your healthcare would be one thing, but I think we have to recognize their implicit biases. And many black and brown people have found, as well as people who um, have a variety of different sexual orientations and gender um, expressions, have found that when they seek healthcare, they're not treated um, with respect, um, and that has turned them off from receiving health care. And so, you know, I can even say as an African American woman, there have been times where I have sought health care or my family members have sought health care, and I have felt like the attention um, to their illness or to their complaint was not um, taken seriously because of who, what they look like. And so, there are implicit biases. So, access alone does not guarantee that someone's going to get quality health care, um, good health care, and the appropriate health care. So it is very important that we teach all of our providers in the healthcare field. Um, we all have implicit biases, but when we're working, we need to put those aside or at least acknowledge them so that we can overcome them to help those who are coming to us um, for care. And so access is one part of it, but um, making sure that we have qualm 
providers that are culturally appropriate that represent our community um, is another thing. And then making sure that that access is um, equitably distributed. So for example, during um, this pandemic, many of our healthcare providers have turned to telemedicine, mm -hmm. which is great for those of us who have internet access. But so many in our lower income communities rely on their internet access by going to the library. And with our libraries being closed, that option of getting healthcare through telemedicine was not available for everyone in our community because they did not have access to the internet. So access is one thing, but it doesn't mean that it is the same healthcare that everyone's getting and that they can um, reach it or, or get it at the same degree as others. Sure. I, get, I think a good example of the cultural competency also would be you can have access. You know, we know that Ohio is the only state in the, the union that doesn't have, you know, medically accurate um, uh, sex education. And so you might be in a classroom and getting lessons that are not accurate. And so you have access, the teachers come in and they've decided to teach something, but it's not the true thing, that, the true lesson that you need to think about how you're empowered, how you have consent, how you build relationships, how you understand your own biological uh, sexual health. And so if access isn't one that um, allows the person who's receiving it to have influence, uh, to determine and, and to, to know for sure that the information that they're getting is, is accurate um, and is culturally uh, respectful, then you only have the face-to-face, -face, you don't really have the, um, the need that you desire uh, for the, um, the real, uh, I guess, equity. It's an inequitable power relationship. And so we need to make sure that we're cautious of that in however we're delivering healthcare. And I think it's really important, not just that our providers be taught the um, competencies, but that people who are receiving the care also, also understand the empowerment that they have to demand it uh, and to be able to say no, to be say yes, and, and to ask for uh, more when they feel as though they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to reinforce that last point about the patients or the customer of that provider or practitioner um, requiring that they be treated uh, equitably, that they are culturally and appropriately um, served uh, based on who they are as an individual. Um, that is so important and it's so powerful. Uh, that's the beauty of federally qualified health centers and, and lookalikes because we are, are required to have 51% of our board members be our customers, our patients. And so they are at the table, the policy table, addressing how the care is provided, when it's provided, where it's provided, hours of provision, and that's powerful. I wish that every public and private entity had its customers serving on its board or advisory committee uh, where the policy decisions, the funding decisions are being made. It's, it's very important because it's a perspective that lets you see firsthand what's going on within your institution. Absolutely. And I would add to that, that the uh, having vehicles that help people to, to understand their role in advocacy and for them to be encouraged uh, to go out and to demand access to the legislation, uh, to hold uh, politicians and executives in the private sector accountable uh, is, a, is an important element of healthcare as well. I'd just add to that too that it's, it's so important, and I don't think that we, as health and human service agencies, we have a lot of support for empowering our patients. And in the FQHC environment, I think that is front and center, but I don't think that's front and center um, in a general healthcare environment. And it's something that I think, you know, we teach our children at age five um, how important it is to brush their teeth. You know, and you, that's embedded in your identity is, is getting your teeth brushed. But we don't do that about so many other aspects of our health. And, 
I think that's something that we could shift culturally is these things that, um, you know, especially as marginalized communities, we have got to empower the communities that have been traumatized by the racism and the homophobia and all those things to recognize it's not wrong to, it is right, actually. It is, it is right to, act, it's to demand the dignity and respect of, in the healthcare environment. And so often I think it's that, um, you know, we self, we self moderate, we say, well, I don't want to be that, you know, I don't want to be that loud lesbian that's yelling in the waiting room, or I don't want to be seen as that, whatever it is. And that, and we, so it's, embedded within us. We've internalized those things and um, I think we have a long way to go culturally to undo those things and for me I feel like that should be a piece of what FQHCs and health departments and and private hospitals should be doing when they talk about how to be a responsible patient is, is learn how to advocate for oneself. What does that look like? Yeah I would agree you know it's really important to us that at Planned Parenthood, we provide great reproductive health care, but it's not just about the health care. It really is about your right to have a sexual life, to have pleasure in your sexual life, to have autonomy over your body, and to make decisions for yourself, and to be able to say yes and no about your health care and uh, your overall um, empowerment within the system. And so I, I agree with you. We, we need to let patients and we need to let the public know that they are more in charge than they think. Mm -hmm. It's not taking the step to demand that often leaves you unempowered. But you know, I think going back to what Iris said and even what Julia said, you know, about teaching our kids to brush their teeth, but we haven't empowered or taught our kids or our community about empowering themselves when they're interacting with their healthcare provider. And to me, that goes back to not having health education standards in Ohio, because if we had health education standards in Ohio, that would be one aspect of that curriculum that we can empower our youth at a very young age, not only to learn about their own health, but also to learn how to talk to a provider and that it is their right and their duty um, to talk to a provider and expect certain things from their relationship with their provider. Yeah. On that note, and, and I totally agree with uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, it needs to be taught and uh, providers, uh, practitioners, clinicians, and staff at all of these health institutions have to understand who the customer is and that they do have a right but I think the other piece is advocacy for self and family. Um, we've got to teach people to be advocates, not just with their practitioner, their uh, uh, healthcare organization, but with policymakers as well. Uh, we've gotten so comfortable, and I'm talking uh, health and human services organizations. Um, we've moved away from advocacy. Um, because people are afraid that their funds are going to be taken away from them at the federal, state, and local level. That if you speak up and speak out for what is needed for the populations that you serve, that you're going to be marginalized as a provider of those services, whatever those services are. And I've watched it as a former city council member, as a state representative, as a state senator, and I've watched it at the federal level. People are um, basically demoralized and uh, encouraged not to be strong advocates when it's their money. It is their money. The federal, state, and local dollars belong to the people right. of our state, our country. Um, but even the institutions, the, the nonprofit uh, institutions across the state and, and in this community um, are fearful. And it's like, I'm glad we have the um, Human Services Chamber, but each institution should be advocating for their constituents, the people that they serve. And uh, we have moved away from that. I, I, I recall back to um, the whole war on poverty. Uh, they started the um, people's rights campaigns and the welfare right organization who were strong advocates um, it was nothing, and, and their mantra in the war on poverty was nothing about us, nothing for us, 
without us. It means the people's voices at the table and the people demanding what they want, what they need uh, with their money. But we've been uh, grooming people to believe that you get what we give you, uh, particularly if they're marginalized economically. And disproportionately, people of color, African American and other women of color are marginalized because they're poor. They're, they live in poverty. And so that's, that's the group of people we really have to encourage to, to champion what they need and hold their elected officials, their policymakers accountable for what they need, what they want uh, to better their lives. Yeah. yeah, Charlotte, I would agree with you that definitely if you stand out, speak out and uh, buck the system, you will be punished, you will be penalized and you will have an economic value. The trusted nature of being a provider is doing that regardless of the pushback. And so, you know, I'm proud to say that at Planned Parenthood, we have that advocacy and we've, um, we've been punished economically, but we've also stood strong and said, rather than fold, rather than, uh, you know, acquiesce to something that we know is not good, we will stand strong for principles. And I think when people, whether they're patients or your community, when they know you will stay in the community, uh, that you uh, will, will take the disadvantage, that you will speak up for them, and more importantly, that you will take tools and resources to help them uh, to be empowered to do this, uh, to speak up to their legislators um, and to demand change and, and, to, and to see the results, to make sure that you understand the importance of voting uh, and to understand it's as simple as, you know, that you deserve sex education in the schools. Uh, it's, and so there are, and I think you're, you're probably one of those two, there are those organizations that will survive because they are willing to do the hard things, to take the hard knocks. And that is the role model, I think, that will encourage others to also do that. And it, you know, really depends on the stream you're in, but no fault, no foul, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do you, do you find that sometimes when you, um, if you're penalized for speaking up maybe, and your, you know, your funding is cut on the, the one hand, it, reveals allies and supporters on the other side because you spoke up, because you used your voice and you took a risk. Um, and so you gained support from maybe other areas that you didn't know were your supporters because they saw you being silenced or tried, someone tried to silence you and to, you know, with, withhold funds or other resources. Right. Well, I, I, not only I think are you rewarded on other sides, but the people that you stood for are rewarded because they then become fearless. It didn't hurt as much as they thought. They're still here. We're still standing. And, and that's an important part of uh, being willing to take the knocks and to stand with the people who have the needs. Mm -hmm. You also get respect from the systems. We've been talking about the public and the private sector. Uh, you get respect from them and you have the right to ask them to work together. And I think that's one of the things that uh, we were talking about that public pro private partnership that we know is not working as, as much. I, I think a great example would be if you look at, you know, we've got a Supreme Court case uh, coming up that will dictate whether or not employers have the right to put limitations on their employees insurance getting uh, a birth control. And they may say, well, you know, it's not my problem. You figure out how to get it some other way. But we also know that about 28% of, of pregnancies in uh, among reproductive age women who are employed are unintended pregnancies. So if they can't reach the, um, you know, the life that they want uh, and make decisions about uh, children, then they can't be the same productive employee that you want. And we also know that that's a big expense. It's a big expense uh, to deliver. It's a big expense 
to um, have a child and to have self have care for. So there should be an incentive in our private sector talking to the public sector and trying to mediate uh, policies that have nothing to do with quality of life, but have everything to do with um, uh, political uh, whims. And I think that that doesn't help people and people see that and they know it. And so, yeah, it does come back to mm -hmm. beneficial to you. Great. Thank you. Any other thoughts on that before we, before we move on? So what are some um, community initiatives or resources that will help us achieve this health equity that we've been talking about? What are some, what do we have in place now? And then what are, what are, where are some gaps? So um, I'll start, I mean, obviously at Public Health, we provide a lot of different services to assist those in our community who need a little extra help so that we can have that health equity. You know, a few examples I can share are the work we do with Celebrate One and for infant mortality. We know that um, African American women and women who live in poverty have an increased risk of having a baby who will not make it to their first birthday. And there are certain things we can do to assist them. One is we can help them with a car seat, we can help them with um, safe sleeping in cribs, we have a WIC program to help them with their nutritional aspects of raising a healthy child as well as a healthy mom. Um, so we have those programs, but I think what is most important is the Center for Public Health Innovation that was mentioned early on in this discussion. And when Mayor Ginther back in February of this year declared racism a public health issue and really charged Columbus Public Health to provide him with some initiatives and some recommendations of what we could do to overcome that. And really it's about improving life expectancy and improving the quality of life for everyone that lives in Columbus. And um, by doing that, obviously there will be some focus on black and brown individuals, but by improving the life expectancy and quality of life for that community, we're improving the life expectancy and quality of life for everyone in our community. But, so the center, we already have the data, we already know there's health disparities out there. So what the center is gonna focus on is what can we do about it? Going back to those policies, going back to those interventions, what else can we do to help those who are dealing with those health inequities so that they can improve their quality of life as well as their life expectancy? So stay tuned for some of the recommendations we're gonna be giving the mayor in the near future. Wonderful. Just to kind of follow up on that, then the Center for Healthy Health Innovation, we were talking earlier about making sure that um, voices of the constituents or the, those who are at the table. So do you think that um, that we have a good representation uh, from the community that, uh, that are engaged in this Center for Health Innovation? Or is it representative of the community, I guess is my question. So the Center for Public Health Innovation is um, taking some programs that already existed here at Columbus Public Health and putting them under one roof or one umbrella, so to speak. And clearly we're doing that while we're also responding to the pandemic. So yes, we will be engaging the community. We will have a group of stakeholders that will be um, soliciting advice and recommendations for to help us provide this guidance that we can give to the mayor. Um, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but we will. So just stay tuned. We'll be reaching out to many of our constituents to help us with that. Right. I think a, a couple other priorities may have gotten in the way of, of you getting started. So and that's okay. understandable for sure. So thank you. I like, I like the idea, Dr. Roberts, of um, the innovation. We are also looking at how can we use innovation and, and technology, especially with young people. Uh, so we have this great program, it's Chat Text. And the beauty of it is you can text any question, especially a sexual health question, uh, anonymously and get a response to it. Trained educators, trained healthcare people who give no judgment, no value, just the plain truth. The wonderful thing that we see about it that is really empowering is within that, within about a month, we see about a third of the people who have chat and text with our um, educators and providers walk into a health center to get care. So it's that sense that they were empowered, they got a, a, 
a question answered that they couldn't find a resource in their own community or in their own home. And it was that, that trusted relationship. And I think on this whole, whole empowerment mode as well, we're really um, very happy to be doing a lot of work in peer education, so peer to peer. Because especially with young people, they learn mostly from each other. And if you teach one, who can teach another? So we're doing a lot of work in taking young people and teaching them for a year how, in, how to teach others and how to be advocates with others and um, how to engage in a way that's factual and medically accurate. And there, you know, the one turns into 10, who turns into 100, who turns into 1,000. And so you actually see the community with people who have the accurate information, who are empowered, and who have done it themselves. You know? And so we think that, that those are some of the innovative things, as well as our Ohio Center for Sex Education, where um, we are bringing what we believe are the best thought leaders in the country uh, to Ohio um, and using the best thought leaders within Ohio so that we are having a national connection. So that's wonderful. Okay, thank you. Great resources. Any, are there any others that you all want to, to provide? I'd love to just speak quickly um, in terms of the community that, that I'm primarily serving as um, the LGBTQ plus community. We've put together directories that will link um, that population with culturally humble providers um, to address these health disparities. And I think the last comment I just wanna make is um, that I think it's important as we talk about women that we always are asking ourselves, which women are we talking about? And make sure that we're expansively thinking of women. Um, we are talking about trans women. We're talking about people who are non-binary identified, but maybe experiencing some of the same things that women would because of gender-based discrimination. And of course, all the ways that um, race and class and ethnicity intersect with gender, um, gender identity and expression and sexual orientation. So. Um, I put other resources in the Google Doc, and um, people can check those out there as well. Great. I'm glad you mentioned that. We will have the other resources that you all have mentioned in the Google Doc as well. If, if anyone listening that wants to um, access that, it is a multi-language, and there's also great information on there about uh, COVID-19 resources. Um, uh, yes, I would, I would Marcia, just like to wrap up. Yeah, I would just like to add, there are a couple of initiatives that I think we should highlight. Not only uh, are we fortunate to have the Women's Fund of Central Ohio and certainly the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, but Councilwoman uh, Priscilla Tyson has started the Commission on Black Girls and President Pro Tem Liz Brown started uh, th this initiative on paid family leave. She's working really hard uh, with women's groups throughout the, the county and the state on that. And then certainly I wanna reinforce uh, what Mayor Ginther and Director Roberts have done with not only the Center for Public Health Innovation, but also the Opportunity City. And then our County of Franklin uh, declaring uh, racism as a public health crisis along with the City of Columbus. And then the Rise Together uh, initiative to address poverty are some uh, other efforts that will rise up um, our communities of women and girls uh, and, and women and girls of color. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, on, on that note, we are at our end time. Uh, we didn't get to, to any of the questions that were posted in the chat box, but we'll certainly make sure that we um, follow up maybe with you individually to get some answers for our audience and we can then add them to our to our Google Doc. So again, I just want to say thank you so, so much for your time, for your expertise, for all the work that you are doing in the community to uh, foster a, um, an equitable community for all citizens. Um, so it's a special thank you to um, Senator Charlita Tavares, to Dr. Roberts, to uh, Iris Harvey to Julia Applegate. Thank you all so much for your time. And with that, thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Bye, thank you. Bye, Dr. Roberts. Bye, Julia.